final presentation now, uh, and this one uh, is being uh, provided by Leslie uh, from Islington, and she's going to be talking about uh, integrated outcomes framework that's being that she's developed in Islington. So I'll hand over to you, Leslie. Hi there. Um, you've got my slides, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Hi there. Yeah, so I'm Leslie. I'm head of children's services for Whittington Health and I'm also the designated clinical officer uh, and I'm involved in quite a lot of tribunals, <laughs> as I'm sure many people are that are here. So I suppose the first question we need to ask ourselves is why why do we need to prevent disputes in the first place? Um, you know, bearing in mind all the things that have been said about relationships with families and how difficult that can be. However, there's also a cost to our tribunal system uh, that we have at the moment. And I was really interested, actually, what Jane was saying earlier um, regarding how important it is that we're really clear and articulate about our provision that we're going to offer from the NHS. To, uh, and that is the starter, really, of how we can prevent disputes and one of the reasons why we have developed an outcomes framework. Uh, but I'm just very quickly just going to flip through some of the other reasons why we need to uh, prevent disputes. So you can move the slides on. So one is that the increasing numbers of appeals that we have, um, which I'm sure all of you uh, are seeing. Uh, we had a bit of a dip over COVID period, but we've certainly are back on track now for having a number of appeals. And a lot of those appeals are about Section F, and I am a therapist by background, and um, that's an area where we are often drawn into uh, the tribunal process. Uh, the next one. Uh, and we did a calculation about how many hours our therapists are spending um, either uh, completing assessments or reports or attending a tribunal. Uh, and already um, we are up to about 126 hours of a clinician's time over a quarter has been spent on uh, some of the work around the tribunals. And that doesn't actually include my time uh, as the DCO, as a support officer for those clinicians or the managers that also often get involved uh, in reading reports and uh, and checking um, information before it goes to the tribunal. Next one. Uh, yeah, and as everybody is seeing, this is just a really quick slide to say we're also seeing a big increase in need in our borough, uh, and I'm sure that's the same for everybody else, uh, which means often we're also then seeing a, a significant increase in requests for education, health and care plans uh, and the additional support that these young people will need uh, either in uh, mainstream schools or indeed in, in our special schools. Next slide. Uh, yeah, and in Islington, we are doing some work with ISOS as well, um, looking at um, dispute resolutions uh, and looking at one of the, you know, the reasons are behind our increase in disputes um, in terms of our rates uh, of appeals. The definition around SEN, and I think that's a really interesting one for us to discuss because the threshold for requests to assess uh, has certainly changed uh, in my time, and I've been around since statementing days, um, and um, also, you know, the tension that there is between uh, families and children uh, and the local authority at times uh, around some of the disputes that we're having can lead to a breakdown, and that's, you know, not not good when we have, you know, children and families who we're going to be working a lifetime with. Next one. And this is just a very quick our win lose rate. So we can see now we're we're not winning as many as we used to either. Um, and that's not good for anybody either uh, in terms of um, you know parental attitudes towards um, the local authority um, when they're perceived to have you know that we have perceived to have lost a case and their trust in us uh, can also be um, you know affected by that. Next one. And also, you know, we can't forget the pressure that this can put onto our high needs funding. Um, often if we lose a case against uh, particularly if a private provider has put in, and I asked this question earlier, uh, has put in a, um, you know, a very detailed assessment of the child and with high level of recommendation of provision. Um, and we lose that case and we are unable as a, as a local authority or, or as a health service to provide the additional support that has been recommended uh, or, or, or ordered by the court, then actually that often then puts pressure on our local authorities to fund either additional assessment or additional um, treatment packages, either from the NHS or from private providers uh, as well. Next slide. 
Um, yeah, this is just really just showing you again the number and I, 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 nowhere near as many as yours, Claire, as if you do say a thousand a year. So, uh, yeah, we, we've got quite a lot of, I thought we had a lot of EHCs, but perhaps we don't have as, nowhere near as much as what they do for the whole of Somerset. Um, but we certainly are seeing a, a significant increase in uh, the request for uh, education, health and care plans. Next slide. OK, so. Um, the real crux of this presentation is really what what are we, what are we going to do about making uh, sure that families feel confident um, in the um, assessment and advice and interventions that we will provide in order to support their child's outcomes. So it's really important uh, that we do provide very clear and measurable integrated goals um, that, that are, are specified and are very clear um, to the family about what is going to be provided and, and what the outcome will be. And this is really important because this information will inform about what appropriate provisions should be made, where appropriate placements should be made, um, and also measuring our effectiveness. So, you know, how do we measure that we've actually met a child's outcomes um, within the context of the whole of the education, health and care plan? Um, and also if we have any other challenges, if we try to uh, cease the provision, uh, then where, where is our evidence that we've actually met the objectives that we said that we were going to work on um, with that child and family um, and also, um, you know, the number of tribunals that we're having to attend. Next one. So we uh, a number of years ago, actually, but probably implemented just pre COVID <laughs> as, as many things were just about to be starting to go on and then they went on a bit of a, a back burner. But uh, certainly uh, this is something that we've developed in Islington um, and this is an outcomes framework uh, which is based on the outcomes from the Preparing for Adulthood. Uh, we've got seven themed areas of goals uh, within our outcomes framework. Uh, and there's um, detailed information for practitioners about how to write spe specific information on the education, health, health and care plan linked to outcomes uh, that have already been specified. And also we have um, uh, developed as part of that process an outcomes database so that they we're able to actually demonstrate whether we are working towards and meeting the outcomes which we stated in the education, health and care plan and that they are linked to the four preparing for adulthood outcomes. Um, next slide. So what did we do? Uh, we had a number of away days uh, with our CAMS practitioners, with our health team, education, social care, the voluntary sector and our parents and carers from our parent care forum uh, to agree details around what the uh, outcomes should look like. And we developed what we call a bucket of outcomes just to help practitioners guide them in their thinking when they're writing uh, their education um, advice. Um, and we also did a whole load of writing on SMART goals. Now, I feel like we've been talking about how to write a SMART goal for <laughs> millions of years, but actually it was really good to go back and remind people what SMART really looks like. Um, and certainly within our borough, the word ongoing is absolutely barred. And those of you who are in the audience uh, from Islington will know that I constantly go on about anybody using anything that is ongoing is just not appropriate. <laughs> Uh, because actually, how do we know that we've met the outcome if we are going to be ongoing? Um, we've also integrated this within our um, in our EPR system, um, so we are able to write adulthood system within our. We have Rio, um, and we can link that into Rio, and I'll show you that a bit more. Um, this all helps with producing report and evidence around the effectiveness of the services uh, which we provide. Next slide. Uh, we can move on from that. That's just reminding you. I'm sure everybody knows the PFA, but if you don't, there it is. Um, so this is our bucket of outcomes that we have developed. Um, so as you can see, it's all linked to the uh, five, uh, the four parent for adulthood outcomes. Um, and within this, uh, there are seven uh, different domains which are all linked to a whole range of practitioners, normal advice of so the speech therapist might be writing, you know, primarily around, you know, developing friends and relationships, mental health, uh, CAM services might be writing more around health and well-being. But this is a whole framework of different outcomes that you would be working towards. And as you see that they're all coded along along the side and the coding is linked to our uh, Rio outcomes so that we know which specific um, outcome that you've been working on in terms of your intervention with with a child. So if you skip through these because there's quite a few. So this is just showing you uh, how they will go and the final one is. Uh, 
yeah, down to uh, employment qualifications. So you can see there's lots of different information that you could put into into those areas. And we also give guidance to our practitioners on how we write medium and short term goals within that just to give remind them this is how we want them uh, to be writing those goals. Um, next one. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Uh, yeah, that's the same thing as well. So each of those, we then have some examples for practitioners around how to how to write the goal. Um, so once we we did this piece of work, we've developed this framework. We've done a load of training for staff across the system in how to use it. Uh, we also developed a single what we call an FA3 form, and I actually got nationally it was called that, but I think it might be just an Islington um, name. So the FA3 is the advice form uh, that is requested from education uh, before we um, issue an education health and care plan, and the information goes into the um, uh, into the into the plan itself. So this form is uh, collated on a central database and it's completed by um, all the practitioners in the NHS who are working with that family. So therapy, paediatrics, CAMS, nursing, etc. Um, and they're all asked to contribute uh, on this single form so that it prevents duplication. So we're not repeating the same things as some of the other practitioners are, have already already said. Um, and that we then um, make sure that the information that we are writing around outcomes and our goals are then put into our database. Um, all the submissions on the FA3 are checked uh, by myself as a DCO um, and there's a lead key worker for um, all of those um, uh, applications that are put forward so they, they're double checked with them to make sure the practitioner, all the practitioners have contributed before it goes off. Um, this is all then recorded uh, in one place, which means that we know who's late in providing their uh, information, which gives me as a DCO uh, leverage to uh, go and talk to those clinicians to make sure that they get their information in within the six weeks. Uh, and we can look at what the holdups might be um, and any um, issues that we might have in providing that advice. Um, and we can share this across the borough as well. Um, so we share this practice and we, we, work, we work across four boroughs. Uh, in Islington, Haringey, uh, Barnet and Camden. Next slide. So this is what the form looks like. Um, uh, and again, it's just got basic information about the child. We always ask about the child's voice if that's possible to get that. And obviously about what the parental aspirations are. Next slide. Uh, so you can see there the template uh, with the areas um, of uh, skill deficit and development areas and how this impacts more the most importantly, how does this impact on this child's uh, ability to be able to access education and the different areas of the PFA. Uh, and then these are all summarised and then on our final sheet, uh, we look at the PFA areas and what are the outcomes that we are looking to work towards. And of course, the, the, the focus often, unfortunately, is around what resources might be required in order to uh, meet that needs. Next slide. You can move on from that. That's just in case you don't know how to write a SMART goal. Um, I will come back to something else on that in a minute, but I just wanted to show you if anybody's on Rio, how easy it is to uh, record an outcome linked to the PFA within the uh, patient specified functional scale, the PSFS, which is which is in Rio already. Uh, so we use that by putting the code uh, that we're using on the framework so that we know when we've come back and measured it, we can record whether that goal has been met, partially met or or not met at all. Um, so that's if you're in a Rio system, that's where it is in the Rio. Uh, you can move on to the next system. Uh, yeah, so then this links into our whole database. Um, so that information is pulled through into our what we have click view, uh, which is where we get our clinical information from, which comes directly from Rio. Next one. Um, and yeah, and so this then pulls off a uh, report through that uh, out outcomes database which is this is where it was right at the beginning. But if you move to the next slide, we're now up to. Um, yeah, so you can see there we've got over about 2000 goals that we have measured as to whether we have achieved them or not. Uh, and the report that comes off is generated will show you which area of the PFA that we have worked on. Um, and uh, on the next slide, it will show you how much of those goals have been met in terms of 
the level of improvement that has been made in each each of those goals. So obviously 89% here, um, there's been significant improvement and that will be linked back to the goal that has been been established um, already. Um, also, we're able to pull off here details about how long it takes us to complete the assessments uh, and what our percentage of completion is within the, the six week times time time scale as well. So all this information really just gives us evidence about the effectiveness of the of the local service. Uh, and I think that's really important in instilling confidence um, with with parents um, and people. Next next slide. Um, OK, so I, I've just given you an example here of something that we use quite a lot now in tribunals, particularly, but also in writing all our advice is that we must be very specified. And, and Jane mentioned that this morning. Um, and these are kind of some what you must do. Uh, and I'm just going to give you an example on the next slide here. Um, yeah. You move to the next slide. Yeah, so here you must never leave in any doubt. <laughs> this is what I always say to the practitioners. Never leave any in doubt. What are you going to deliver? How are you going to deliver it? And what you hope to have achieved by the end of that? So this is just a, a, a very simple example of, of something that is really specified in terms of this young person will receive a 35 minute session per term in reception with a suitably qualified speech therapist to support the development of speech language communication skills. Each session will consist of 20 direct minutes of actual doing therapy, 15 minutes of indirect contact, and so that could be talking to the TA, uh, and a 30 minute session per term to monitor staff's ability to be able to carry out uh, an update uh, advice and strategies within the classroom. And then we take it even further just so that nobody is really in any doubt what we're going to do. We then specify what it is we're going to do in terms of a direct session. Um, so this will in, the, in this example here it will, include, will include developing PECs, etc, etc. Um, if you move to the next one. And then we also as in, as a, as important, which often is often forgot, is um, what indirect sessions will also look like. So this is what we're going to provide in terms of our indirect sessions for that additional 15 minutes and the other 30 minutes that we might provide per term as well. Um, so I think you can see how clearly specified that is. And our feedback from tribunals is that they've really welcomed this because it, it just leaves you in no doubt what you're going to get. Whether there's a dispute still, whether that's enough, uh, to meet the outcome. Um, clearly, that's something we, we would be in tribunal about. Uh, but anyway, I think it just gives it a really clear uh, uh, understanding of, of what it is we're going to do. Next slide. Yeah, and there are just some you must uh, look at your terminology, make sure you don't have too many outcomes uh, and use an MDT approach, I think is really important. And using a framework like PFA is really helpful in terms of articulating a single language of outcomes across your borough next or area. So I was also asked to just mention about um, what we do in terms of writing for a tribunal. Um, and I suppose we have a, a standard template which we've developed over a number of years to make sure that our uh, evidence and advice is weighted as strongly as the 32 page private provider advice that we often are in tribunal up against. Um, so I've just given you, I can give you the whole um, template, but I've just pulled off a few things that I think are really helpful. One is about your professional declaration um, and to give really good details that you are a professional in your own right uh, and that you've got a number of skills and number of years of experience um, of working um, with children. Um, and it's really good to remember to put all your training that you have also been on because, you know, I'm an OT by background and the amount of times we're asked for a you know, suitably qualified sensory integration therapist rather than an occupational therapist uh, is, is quite frustrating. Um, next slide. Um, yeah, so, so just to expand on that, we often put in what our experience is. So, you know, I've worked for 25 years as an occupational therapist working with children with autism, blah, de, blah, de, blah. To just give a brief that you are a credible uh, witness, um, that you've got a degree, you know, um, and any other specialist training that you might have. And also really importantly, how long have you known that child for? And this is something again that Jane mentioned. That's really important because, you know, you're more likely to have known that child for a number of years and seen the rate of change um, that that child is able to make with intervention. Next slide. Um, 
Yes, and then this is about where you put your speci specified uh, information here and the goals and the treatment approach that you're going to use as well. Uh, I think that's a useful thing because, you know, even whole classroom treatment approach, you know, is, is an approach um, to working with children and that needs to be emphasised that language communication is embedded within the classroom uh, and that you would be working to expand that for the whole classroom, not just as individual child is really important to put in, uh, as well as, you know, any group or one to one treatment that you may or may not do. Um, and then also you could put in here about uh, whether the child has plateaued or whether they have progressed despite having intervention. So you might have given this child significant amount of intervention previously and actually they didn't make very much progress. So actually that approach of direct work hasn't worked or does not work in this context. Um, so again, you can put all those kind of pieces of information in here and also a program of what the work is that you would be expecting the school to do. Uh, and that's something you often don't see from the private provider, but it's something that certainly the NHS nearly always provide a kind of program for the TA um, um, to um, put in as well. Um, and the, yeah, I've just re-emphasised here to try and demonstrate that we know the child very well and it's based on our experience with the child that that, that is why we make this recommendation. Um, next slide. And then the other slide which I think is probably quite unique to us and I'm not sure whether anybody else does it be interested to hear is that we also put an evidence based practice in here so we may even reference journal articles uh, we will certainly be referencing uh, for example the Royal College briefings on sensory integration uh, they would all be referenced in this you know our different approaches like co-op etc our, our take on things like handwriting where's the evidence around occupational therapy be the being the lead for uh, developing a child's handwriting etc so that's a really and also you know evidence around a whole, how good a whole school approach is or a whole classroom approach uh, to supporting a child. Uh, so we would put in our evidence and references there at the end as well, which I think is really helpful. Uh, next slide. And then this is really, and this is my point also this morning, is about never be afraid to appraise the private provider's advice, even though it can feel quite daunting, particularly if you don't know the child. And this sometimes happens, you know, that we we haven't, the child hasn't even been referred for speech therapy or OT, yet we're getting a private practice uh, report saying this child requires, you know, weekly, daily uh, therapy. So, um, you know, we have started this much more recently uh, and Robert, who's in, in the, on the chat, will probably also uh, be able to say something about this. And I think it's, it's, it's time consuming to do, but actually it could have a good outcome uh, and we're waiting to see whether it does. But this is really around don't be afraid to dispute <laughs> what the private provider has assessed or recommended. You need to reflect on your own current caseload that you're already working with children who may have a similar level of need. Um, present an integrated approach because it's not just about a single provider. You know, the approach that you get by working with your local provider is that they're already integrated and embedded within a whole uh, MDT or multi agency approach to supporting that family. Um, challenge clinic based first. Um, versus classroom based activities. You know, we're constantly saying we shouldn't be taking children out of school for an hour session in a clinic room if they need, you know, sensory integration, which sometimes has been recommended, uh, that that's a detriment to that child's education. And also is that child ability to be able to transfer that skill back into the classroom? Um, and also, is it something that education uh, educates and trains the child? Uh, so again, you can challenge on that. Again, use your evidence based interventions and your research uh, and knowledge uh, around different approaches to that child uh, and shout about your own CPD saying, yeah, I haven't seen this child, but I, I have worked with lots of children over many years who have got similar levels of needs and I'm embedded within the working style or approach within our, our, our your local area. And again, you make sure you use college guidance as well. Uh, I think that might be it. Yeah. So that's a whistle top store <laughs> of uh, just how we have uh, are trying to uh, support this process uh, from a practitioner point of view. Thank Thank you. You've had so many, so many comments on the chat, but I'm, I'm not going to cover them all. <laughs> it's a very hot topic, I think. <laughs> so lots and lots of interest. I'm going to try and get through as many questions as possible. Um, I'm looking back at the chat, but some of these questions do relate to things that you said. <laughs> so I might have to bring people back in just to, to uh, uh, ask uh, for more detail. Um, I'll start with the one hand up then. Tasha, did you want to start off? Hi, Natasha. 
sorry, it was not coming off mute for some reason. <laughs> Hi, um, thanks very much, Leslie. I think it's a very um, inspiring um, framework that you've developed, and I love the fact that you can collate your outcomes in such a systematic way. Um, my challenge to you is just a little around um, having buckets of um, outcomes and how do we make sure that they're personalized for children um, and that, um, I mean, I, I really appreciate the the stress on the system in terms of churning out EHC reports and wanting to do it as efficiently as possible, but ultimately the importance of being person centred for our children. How do we get that balance right? And it, well, they're not prescribed. And if you look at them, they're just suggestions in each of those areas. But what we're trying to do is group them. So when you say your goal is a particular thing, that actually which part of that grouping would you say that that was in? So they would be specific and written directly for that child young person um, but they would what we try and do is link them with the code so that we know when it goes into our database that actually we are pulling things off around that child's development of language communication or social skills but it would the goal itself will be very specific to that to that child so we wouldn't have that level of detail of what the actual goal written was what we would have is where it sits within our framework in terms of data reporting Okay. Yeah, you'd have to go right into the clinical note to see the actual written specified information like I demonstrated, you know, um, there. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Thanks, Natasha. Um, so just going back to the beginning of your presentation, um, we've got a couple of questions in regards to um, using DCOs to check submissions. Um, have you had, uh, Hannah Jeffrey asked whether or not any, uh, you've had any refusals or resistance to people having submissions checked by DCOs? <laughs> no, I don't, well, I've never had any direct. <laughs> uh, it's more of a quality check to make sure that, um, you know, what has been written is, is appropriate. It's not a very detailed check and it's much more of a monitoring of making sure you put advice in. And I have to say, and, and I know my CAMS colleagues would agree, getting CAMS involved was a real challenge at first because they had never been used to writing for the old statements. And when we moved into this new system, they were a bit surprised that they had a time scale and they had to write something and they had to write it in an outcomes framework way. Um, so that was difficult. It took that they were probably the longest group that it took to convince to work in this way and to use the outcome framework. Um, but but involving them in writing some of the outcomes um, has was was the way that we worked around that. Um, but yeah, it's more of a monitoring, making sure that they submit it on time. And if not, why not? Um, rather than necessarily lots of level of detail or scrutiny over what they've actually written. Thanks. And just following on to that, uh, Susan Doty asked uh, how long it takes for DCOs to, to do those, to carry out those checks. Uh, well, we do them as part of our um, Education, Health and Care Management Board. Um, so they are checked. Uh, well, we have a fortnightly board with all of our uh, right from which children we're agreeing to assess. Yeah, you've got loads of things to do. Yeah. Hey. I, I didn't hear that. Yeah, I think somebody forgot to take themselves. I think oh, right. put themselves on mute. <laughs> um, and also, um, Sarah Childs from Bromley asked whether adult services are also signed up to the framework. Yes, they are. Um, as much as they possibly can be. But yeah, they, they were involved actually in the development of it um, and they do already use it in their adult uh, assessment. Fantastic. Um, so I had a question from Vicky Ingram. Uh, she wants to know what platform you use for EHC EHCP requests um, they're using the hub but they've had some challenges with it. We have we have an internal system. That's it's it. on our internal platform. There is a, going to be a development of one that's shared across the local authority and health but this is a, this is sits in the Whittington's health platform. So um, but yeah we haven't developed that yet which is going to be part of our reviewing um, system. So maybe one of the guys from the local authority could come and talk about that one is developed. Finally. <laughs> uh, another one from Vicky Ingram. Um, it's really interesting to hear your presentation. Um, interested in your data and, and where you're, uh, what are you using to obtain the, the kind of data that you're, you're sharing today? So the data, the clinical data comes from Rio and it comes through a system called ClickView, which is where we get all of our um, clinical data synthesized into particular reporting formats. So diagnostic codings and things like that are also in there. And we have a report that pulls off our outcomes. So the therapists write their 
PSFA goal at the beginning. Uh, and then after their I don't know, six week block of intervention, uh, they will then review that and that's what we decide whether they have worked on that outcome. Um, and again, that's fed back obviously through the annual review process as well, but it's in terms of our own quality assurance to make sure that our practitioners are working towards the goals in the EHC. And I suppose that was the beginning question. How do we know these big goals that we've got around I don't know, language communication? How do we know that we've actually worked towards or achieved that? Uh, and this was our way of trying to collect that in a systematic way that we could demonstrate that actually, you know what, we are working uh, reasonably well towards meeting the goals of children in the borough who have got, you know, self-care needs or whatever theme you want. Um, I think maybe following on from that, um, Jack Walker um, asking about how you are measuring progress towards goals or meeting goals. Um, are you using um, goal based outcomes or, or something similar? Well, the PSFS is is, a, is a, the patient specified goal, so they they set their own target at the beginning and their own target at the end, and we look to the measure. It's a bit like a gas goal. Uh, we measure the progress towards meeting that goal, and that's why you get partially met, completely met uh, in terms of the outcome. So you can measure it in those or not met at all. Um, you can me measure your progress towards that. I think so. What was this? It was Rio and the second one. Well, it's the Rio is our, our our electronic patient system, so our clinical note system, and the report reporting system behind that is called ClickView. ClickView with a Q. <laughs> I've got some people in the chat who just want to. They're not familiar with that. Aren't they? But whoever, if you're on Rio, I mean, you might be on a different EPR system, but if you're on Rio, you'll probably have a back back end reporting mechanism. Um, that anything that you put into Rio, so the PSFS is already in Rio. Um, you can you can you can produce a report. Fantastic. You'll have to ask your informatics teams <laughs> to help set that up. Uh, and then we have uh, a question on the um, appraising uh, private therapy reports. Jane Hankins from um, Derby, Derbyshire. Um, is this something that's commissioned and if so, by who? So who, who appraises the private therapy reports? We do <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> um, no, it's done generally when we when we have the capacity, it is done by the the normal clinician um, who's working in that area. So if it's an, a child in a particular school, then it will be that clinician. Um, to do that. There's no additional resources for it. But to be honest, it's probably uh, in the big scheme of things, it's probably quicker um than us um you know seeing that child who's often might not have even been seen yet might be on a waiting list um and we won't be able to see them within the time scale and we've already got the private you know practice report they're already on the way to tribunal um you know we might not have had time to assess that child we would where we possibly could assess the child but it's if we can't uh, or the parent actually and this was mentioned earlier we've got a number of parents that have refused for us to assess and we've appealed to the court uh to ask the parent to let us assess them uh, and the parent has said no and the court has gone with that decision um, and that is difficult because then actually how do we know whether the provision that has been specified is correct for that child's needs? How can we assure ourselves? We've got um, a question from Suzanne. You've got your you've got your hand up. I'll just come to you. It's probably the last question. Yeah. We can't hear you, Susan. You got your mic plugged in. I try that. Try that again. Um, my microphone's on. That's better. No, you can hear you now. It was working for a minute there, Susan. Um, I'll put your question in the chat. Yeah, that might be a better idea. Any other questions um, from Leslie before we move on? Um, Anna. 
Um, yeah, I just wanted to check when you're saying about um, you know, having a look at the, the Commission reports, how successful is that? Because certainly the feedback that we've had, and I think even from where Judge McConnell was saying, we, we get the pushback that you don't know them. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's a newly developing piece of practice for us around okay. using appraisal of the uh, private provider advice when we're in a situation, particularly when a parent won't allow us to assess. When you uh, won't. Oh, OK, so it's when, yeah, that is and that's really tricky. And actually, we would always I think try and assess a child if we possibly could, particularly if we knew we okay. were going to tribunal. Um, but this is when we are not have haven't okay. been able to. Right. Oh no, that's I. Yeah, sorry, I must I missed that because yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we've had to do that because I, I, it, I think certainly we we always want to feed back to judges our concern. You know why why we can't? I think we'd be very honest that we're not going to do it necessarily do a reassessment, but actually we have to at least see that young person because certainly you know just from EP as well as as well as health professionals, you don't want to repeat assessments, do you? But it's just enabling us to meet that young person so that we can give a view no that's helpful yeah. or even seeing them within their setting um mm -hmm. you know but if we haven't got permission to do that from a parent then clearly we won't do that no. um, so this is our only other option really is to do an appraisal of the private providers advice based on our own knowledge and experience yeah and also can i just that's just one we've what just we have a school that's very absolutely you know the young person doesn't Really, they, they're clear. They see this young person every day. A private therapist has gone in and seen them, you know, not even gone, hasn't even gone into school and sees them very differently. That's quite difficult to. Um, I, I th we, I think we get that a lot. I mean, that is probably most of the private providers rarely go into school or they might just go in once. No, but they don't uh, I still the think they need a therapist, though, don't they? They'll, they still need, they won't listen to the school because they'll say, school, Oh, I see. Sorry. And they have only gone into school. Sorry, I thought you meant a therapist already. Are one of, you know, the local therapists had seen them in the school. Um, no, um, no, if they're already known, uh, you know, it makes it a lot easier as well. Um, and we even if we hadn't, you know, we've had children who we don't even think meets the threshold for our assessment because they've got, you know, great language communication skills. But actually, <laughs> you know, then we've been, mm. you know, almost like having to assess a child that we wouldn't normally assess yeah. on our caseload. Absolutely. Uh, and that is where sometimes we we come into difficulties with the local authority about, you know, um, is that is that right that we should do that? You know, should children jump queue? Should children be accepted that we wouldn't normally uh, assess uh, just because, you know, somebody has, you know, if a private provider has identified a specific need, then actually we would then have a duty to assess really because it's been identified as a need. Uh, but often it's very woolly, I would say, some of the advice that we've seen. Um, even like it says it's within normal limits for language and still needs speech therapy or whatever. <laughs> you know, it's a bit, it can be a bit frustrating. Thank you for all your questions. Uh, I think uh, someone's picked up Susan's question, which related to um, what is standard practice. I think Rob's actually picked that up now uh, regarding um, assessing private reports, but if there's anything that um, Leslie wants to add, feel free to drop it in the chat. No, I work with Robert. He can answer that question. <laughs> um, but thank you so much, Leslie. I think you're going to get a lot of inquiries. Onto this, so, um, I've probably been asked to present next week as well. And I was going, I'm sure there'd be the same lot of people next week. So I am I said no, but I still think <laughs> maybe it's not topic. <laughs> yeah, plenty of people still interested to hear what you've got. So um, we will be sharing slides um, afterwards. So uh, I know it was a whistle stop, um, but chance to kind of look over it again um, or also to, to rewatch this session. So thank you. So